Hello, welcome to Virtual Newsmakers. I'm Debbie Ellickson, and I'm here with my co-host Cynthia Seymour and our special guest, Dr. Braxton Cosby. Now, we're excited to have Braxton because he's got a couple of things to share with us, some new ventures he's got uh, on his plate. And one, I want to I want to say congrats to your new book, Braxton, The School of Ministry... The Wingate, and it's uh, about a young man, uh, about six years old, who's struggling to find his place in life after both of his parents are murdered. So uh, that sounds like a real compelling read. I can't wait to, yeah. to think my my eyes on that. And also, you um, have another book that you've you published last year. That's yeah, going to be released, Protostars, mm -hmm. and he's also been nominated or as uh, Jezebel Magazine's 2013 Most Beautiful Atlantean, and he's a doctor of physical <laughs> therapy from the University of Miami, and he's a certified sports nutritionist and personal trainer, but he also has a radio show with Jamie Dukes and several other doctors and it's called Ask the Fat Doctors and uh, so Braxton <laughs> where do we start? Well thank you guys for having me on the show we can start there and um, you know I, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit of just about my background I'm a sure. physical therapist down here uh, uh, near Atlanta and I work in long-term care uh, mainly geriatric patients with uh, orthopedic and neurological issues and, and disease processes and uh, all of that. And I have a team here who I work with. And um, I had a background in pediatric therapy for a while when I was down in Miami. I moved up to Atlanta in 2004. Uh, my wife and I and our three girls are up here now. And um, I just kind of traversed a little bit of everything with physical therapy, done pediatrics, acute care hospital, geriatrics. So I've seen the whole uh, span of therapy. And uh, then I've transitioned a little bit more into some of the entertainment field now. I've done some modeling stuff, and I've, I'm working on a movie over in London, a uh, small film that we're trying to get uh, finished out sometime in the near future. And uh, also have the books that I've written and the radio show here with Jamie Dukes, who works for the Infront Network, um, working with him on the radio show called Ask the Fat Doctors, where it's a weekly uh, show that we do talking about current events and health and wellness and fitness and fitness trends and sports nutrition and all of that stuff, just to try to educate the community um, that will allow them to enable them to uh, take better care of themselves. And uh, you know, we believe in the three E's, educate, um, encourage, and enlighten. And hopefully that makes a difference in our um, in the fight against obesity and the diseases of excess weight. And then lastly is the books that I have out. Um, the School of Ministry is with Keith Publications right now, doing very well. It's won two awards, uh, Reader's Favorite uh, Young Adult Novel of the Year and Literary Classics uh, Young Adult Faith-Based Novel of the Year. And... Um, also, uh, Proto Star, which you mentioned earlier, which is part of the Star Cross saga, that's a trilogy, and that's been picked back up by um, Winter Goose Publications, and that is going to be rebooted uh, in February, probably February, March of 2014. I just finished the last edits yesterday. Very mm -hmm. excited about that. I uh, really awesome. got a good chance to go back through it and overhaul it and really make it the story I think it, it needs to be so that the public can really enjoy it. So you're really, in a lot of ways, juggling this right brain, left brain between the scientist and the doctor yeah. and, <laughs> and the creative. I mean, this is, you know, that's kind of amazing. How do you, how do you juggle all of that? You know, uh, Cynthia, I think the main thing I've always considered myself as is an artist. First, uh, I used to love to draw and, and paint and do things like that, and I just didn't pursue it in college, so I don't think that what I do is any different, you know, with the creative mind, with, with therapy and working with so many uh, demographics, with pediatrics, geriatrics, you know, middle age, uh, the weekend warriors, and then those who are really debilitated. 
you have to be creative. You have to think on the fly. I did home health therapy for a while. You got to take a couple of toys with you, and then you've got to kind of go from there and use the environment. So um, I've used my creative uh, mind to, to do that, to try to give the best therapy I can. And I think when it comes down to creating source material with the books, that's really just my art, my artistry coming out again. You know, uh, uh, people say who read my books, I'm very vivid and very detailed, and that's just like an artist. You know, you go into so much detail trying to create something. And um, I don't think I've really left much of what I've really loved uh, from the beginning. It's just in different forms at this point. Mm. Ah, this, that's really interesting. Last week we had a former nurse, um, Cynthia Sanchez, and her sort of journey between this um, left brain, right brain thing. So it's interesting how, how people connect. Um, we'd love to connect you with her at some point. Awesome. So. So anyway, so tell us a little more about the book uh, and how are you spreading out the information, uh, getting people to? It, it is on Amazon, I see. And is it just? Is it an ebook? Is it uh, a physical book, or is it both? Yeah. I'm um, very fortunate that in this day and age, you know, the ebooks are doing extremely well. We actually, just to celebrate all the accolades that the School of Ministry has gotten so far, we've uh, done a half price sale, so it is on sale now in the ebook. Very, very reasonable uh, price for such a book. I mean, it's 405 pages. And wow. uh, it's the first book, yeah, The Wingate is, is the first book of the School of Ministry series. Um, so mm -hmm. it really kind of hashes out Ziv, who's the main character, his, his flight in life, and how he, his parents were murdered by the age of six, and he was a foster child going from home to home. Always felt like he 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 was looking for his place in life, and he had gifts. He can see uh, he can see demons if he closed his eyes. Um, if they were around, he can feel them uh, in his body. He could just feel their presence and sense them being there. And he just didn't know what that meant. Didn't know if anybody else had the same uh, thing, same gift or not. And he was uh, early on in the book, first chapter. I kind of throw everybody right into the story from the beginning. Uh, by the second chapter, you really kind of see his journey. Uh, mm -hmm. He meets an old um, love of his life named Stephanie. They kind of meet back up after years. He's 18 years old. She had graduated from high school before he did, got married, and then he met her again in Atlanta. And uh, over lunch, uh, he finds out that she's getting divorced. And this is like his big moment to maybe profess his love to her and says he wants to mm -hmm. be with her. So he goes to meet her the next day at her hotel room. And uh, when she when he gets there, everything's in shambles. I mean, all the furniture's turned over, clothes are uh, strewn across the floor in the bed, and then he gets kidnapped. Um, so then the second chapter opens up with you really experiencing what he's going through being kidnapped. And basically the school of ministry said that they came in and they rescued him before he really got uh, hurt by whoever had gotten to Stephanie. And really what they do is they're trying to recruit him because they know he has gifts. They've been watching him for a while. And they really just want to kind of use him as part of their team uh, to hunt down evil and defend the weak. And uh, they say that if he does join them, then they will be more than happy to help him look for Stephanie. So there's a lot of, you know, does he trust him? Who is this group? Is this the truth? But at the end of the day, he's never been a part of something that's big. So he does have a longing to do that. But also he wants to find Stephanie. So if he can use it to his advantage, at least skate it for a while, get Stephanie and get out of there. That's kind of where he'd like to go. So, uh, so, so then it just kind of opens up into this huge adventure with two other recruits that he's with. And, you know, you get those characters being hashed out and, of course, his journey to find Stephanie. Do you see this um, evolving forward into some kind of movie or television series or web series? Yeah. Yeah, I can easily see it being that because the characters are so heavy and, and they're weighty and the the, uh, the imagery is so vivid that you can really, if people are, who are reviewing the book are saying that they can see themselves there, especially since it's told through a first-person perspective. Uh -huh. So you are Ziv throughout the book. So you always, his second guessing is your second guessing. And, and the environments, I tried to uh, keep everything fast moving. There's a lot of environments that the team goes through. There's a, a, an island they're on at one point. There's a train ride. Um, there's, of course, Atlanta, then there's this hidden kingdom that they come across where they have to have these huge battles with people who are quote-unquote evil and demons as well. So it's a lot of energy in the, in the book. And then, of course, there's what everybody loves is a double love triangle. So you got to kind of <laughs> decide if you're going to choose Team Ziv, Team Francis, and then who does Ziv <laughs> choose, you know. So it's kind of cool in that way. 
Let me ask you this. Um, Netflix has got has really burst onto the scene for yeah. um, stepping up and producing these very cutting edge shows. And now we're all hooked on watching them one after the other after the other. Mm -hmm. um, House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. Um, could right. you see this as something like that? You know, I hitting... do. I could, I could see it being a TV show because I tell people that the way I write chapters and books is I write them as, as uh, individual episodes. Okay. Uh huh. So each chapter kind of stands on its own. Um, the chapters are pretty weighty. Uh, out of the 400 page book, I think each, there's like 26 uh, chapters. Uh -huh. And um, so each one of the chapters is like 20 pages, you know, so I feel like when I write them, I want to get the point across what the subject is with the title of the chapter, and by the time you read the chapter, you kind of have your own episode. So it could easily be a 24, you know, 24 episode mm -hmm. series just from one book, you know, you could go a whole season out of each book, really. Talk so yeah, so I, I do, yeah, yeah, I, I do, I, I kind of made it easy, like, hey guys, boom, here it is, you want source material, it's very simple, just <laughs> go ahead and write it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and well, School of Ministry has gonna be five books, so you can get five seasons right. out of School of Ministry, <laughs> five movies, and um, and if you go with Star Cross Saga, then that's three. So, I have to tell you, um, I've gotten hooked on this silly show that I absolutely love, and it's because it's very cross generational, and it's called The Carrie Diaries, which is uh. the, it's the prequel to Sex yeah. in the City. But right, it's right. told from a teenage point of view, but they're teenagers in 1985. So that's why it's um, cross-generational, because yeah, I'm like, yeah, it them. was yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> that is how my life was when in 1985, and now I'm a right. mother of a teenager, so it's I'm like, oh, no, I, I forgot what it was like to be a teenager. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's a fascinating thing. Yours is for young adults? Well, you know, it's some people now have categorized it as new adult. After people have okay. reviewed it, um, hmm. it may have had the young adult title just because the character was 18. Okay. It really is a book that anybody can pick up. So new adult is more like a little bit of an older crowd. Okay. Uh, a lot of the just about the emotional pull, and yeah. probably you know younger younger people probably will read it might like the adventure, but really wouldn't actually grasp the concept and the messaging in the book as opposed to someone older, man, they definitely feel it. They understand about perseverance, struggle, and yeah. loss. So it really right. hits home with them. That's that's a lot of what the, this this particular show, oddly enough, is about. It's it's very rich in characters. The reason why I keep bringing up these these particular shows is they are really rich in characters, and they are based on books. Mm -hmm. So um, Orange is the New Black, definitely based on a book. Uh, Carrie Diaries um, is Candace Bushnell. You know, so all of a sudden, you're looking at at other books that that this CW network is awesome. Actually, yeah, yeah. So I look I, at that as well. So you're working on a movie right now. Uh, yeah. Are you able to share any details about that? Um, I can tell you about the title. <laughs> <laughs> that's, public, that's public information on the internet. Okay. It's called The Snare. And okay. uh, Stephen Baldwin is involved in the project as well. And I can say it's like an end times kind of thriller, you know, uh, prophetic stuff from the Bible, what's going to cool. happen then, and people unraveling secrets. almost like a Da Vinci Code kind of thing going on with that. So, yeah, it's exciting. Okay, cool. So, yeah. so the, uh, the School of Ministry series is actually faith-based, you said? Is what yeah. is, how it, how does that all tie in? I'm really curious because this is super mm -hmm. fascinating to me. Oh, thank you. Well, here's what it is. What I what I did is I tied it in. Um, the School of Ministry is a group, an organization that is basically a derivative of the group called the Way. When Jesus Christ was crucified, he left behind his disciples, and they made up a group called the Way, which basically just you know they're continuing the word, they're preaching, they're trying to get people saved and and everything. And this was a, imagine where they would be now uh, if we fast forwarded, the way it would still exist within the form of the school, the ministry. And they Very love cool. to recruit young people, teach them how to use their spiritual powers. You know, um, Ziv has the gift of, of sight. He can see uh, demons. You know, Francis has the gift of resurrection. They haven't really decided what that is yet. If that means that he doesn't die or if that means he can bring people back from the dead. Huh. You know, huh. Jathan, Jathan can, uh, has the gift of uh, he can charm people. He can convince them to do what he likes and manipulate them. You know, so each one of them has <laughs> gifts. 
they train them up in weaponry. You know, they had, there's a, a guy there who's a trainer named Maxwell. He teaches them how to use weapons, um, you know, as far as knives and all of that. So it's got this Hunger Games kind of feel to it, uh-huh. too, as far as the action is concerned. And uh, what I wanted to do, my aim with the book was to not make it a preachy religious book where people put it right. down, oh, God, here we go. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I've been so grateful because that's what people have said. They've read it and they go, man, this is not religious propaganda. This is like, okay, you get the spiritual connection here. You understand spiritually this is God giving everybody gifts and now these people are just utilizing them great but there's a real heartfelt story here with these characters nice. and they feel and they, they <laughs> breathe and they live and and they just want to accomplish things you know which is majority of all of us they have their goals set before them and then there's always this little bit of a doubt you know what is the school who, who, who really is running this organization and, and Ziv lives in it because he's had doubt for all of his life anyway you know moving from foster home so um, mm. so I was a, I was successful in doing what I set out to do, which is basically have something that had a um, spiritual spine to it, but yeah. basically the extensions go, you know, they, they just make it real. They make God real. They make the spirituality real rather than religion. I love it. I love it. Have you seen Unconditional? No, I have not. I'm going to send you a, a link to that because it is so worth seeing. Okay. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the Fat Doctors and how that came about and, and why a radio show and not a webcast or, or not a television show. Right. Well, we actually went podcast for a while, and then we got some good return on it, and then we decided to make it into a weekly radio show. And basically, uh, the community down here in Atlanta, you know, um, when we talk about numbers of obesity, they say that you know we're around 60 percent of the world is obese now. They say by year 2050, 90 percent of the world will be not just overweight but obese, um, and that puts people at a high risk of heart disease, stroke, uh, bone disease, and just really just the body just breaking down, not being able to metabolize all the excess uh, chemicals in the, in the body that could be from sugar, diabetes. It could be from um, just joint deterioration, everything. So uh, Ask the Fat Dog is just a fun mashup. Gets people, we talk about the current events, and people come right in, they listen to it, they'll, they'll hear something funny. We'll talk about, you know, just yesterday we talked a little bit about what's going on in the NFL with head injuries and some of the yeah. Hall of Fame athletes now saying that they have uh, CTE, which is chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy. So it's very scary because here it is, you can retire, be a millionaire, and then 20 years later now you're losing your mind. I know um, three. So I know three NHL players that committed suicide. Wow, that seems that's to be related to that. And here's the other caveat. Now we're talking about all sports where there's contact. It's not just NFL, but hockey. Like yeah. you say, I mean, they, they hit each other around a lot as well. Boxing has always been there. Look at Muhammad Ali. So we talk about things like that. We open up, and then we'll actually get into what the topic is. You know, yesterday we were talking about winterizing your 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 fall workouts. How do you still work <laughs> out with the weather changing? You know, so. Those types of things are what we do, and then the show comes on uh, eight o'clock on Saturdays that people can hear, uh, can listen to at eight o'clock Eastern in the morning. Is it what we're eating, or is it lack of exercise, or is it the in actual ingredients in our foods today, or what? What would you say is maybe the number one concern we should have? If if I'm going to say the number one concern, I'm going to say the volume mm. of what we're eating. I really, I really think we're just abusing the amount of the amount of which we eat. When you look at countries uh, and their re- obesity rates, um, a lot mm. of it is based on the amount. I mean, Americans overeat. Right. <laughs> we really right. do, and we throw food away all the time. Mm. You think about the supermarkets, how they, they basically produce all this food and they throw it away at the end of the day if nobody buys it. Um, we just really waste a lot of food and. I have a lot of people who I know, they go, oh, I don't eat this, I don't eat that. And I know vegetarians who are obese. I'm like, how are you obese? You know, I mean, you're cutting down what you're eating, what you feel is making you sick, but then you're overeating all this, quote, unquote, good stuff, you know? Yeah. So there's a volume issue that's here at risk. And I tell people all the time, they say, well, I'm not a person with exercise. I don't like to get out and move. Well, then you can control the volume. I came up with the Eat Less, Move More campaign that I run through my blog site. And it was really trying to make, uh, trying to simplify health and wellness by telling people, hey, why don't you eat less and just move more? Make it simple. Don't do all these crazy diets and these fad things and get yeah. all hooked into that. But basically take your your plate, your normal portion of food, cut half of it. Eat only half, put the other half away for later or maybe tomorrow, and then uh, use a pedometer or something. See how many steps you take in a day 
and try to double it. So you're just going to eat less and move more, make it very simple. Once you actually embrace exercise and eating better, because that's the components here that you're manipulating, uh -huh. then when you realize you're not making any changes and you're not getting it, and you, you may probably lose some weight initially, when you're ready to move on now, go to some more of those complicated things. But people give up so easily. They start an exercise routine, they get sore the next day, boom, I'm done. You know? Yeah. So I made something that's not really changing what you normally do, but just a little bit of a modification. And that way people can accept it and they can move forward in it much easier. And then it becomes a part of their lifestyle change. So um, really quickly, you, what you're saying is it's the little baby steps that count more added up than having to try to do these monumental things and then get discouraged. Yeah, rather than take one swing and knock a tree down, why don't you, you know, chip <laughs> away at it, I guess. Yeah. We have Nazim Beltran. He's, he's a web developer out of Milan that's watching in today. And he's asked us a question um, that I'd like to share. He wants to know, can you please talk about the influence your uncle had toward the goals you're currently undergoing? Can right. you answer that? Uh, my uncle is, you know, he's really an amazing man in that the time that he came up uh, during the 60s and the 70s and, and the era um, in which, you know, what was on TV. Blacks were not on TV. They weren't on radio and they certainly weren't selling out big pavilions with comedy. <laughs> um, and uh, the most intriguing thing about him was his dedication to what he believed he was going to do. And, and I, I say that in the sense that during the time when he really started getting popular in the 80s, people were doing their own type of comedy. They were cursing. They were insulting people. Yeah. He stayed with the clean brand of Cosby comedy that he believed was yeah. going to work. And I was with him Two years ago, we were doing book signings, and I asked him, I said, how did you stay uh, so uh, dedicated to what you believed? I mean, there were people out there cursing who were very successful. Yeah, um, I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. I said, how did you do it? Because I'm sure that somebody came to you and said, hey, Bill, if you do a movie like this, or if you change your comment like this, you... I said, I know they asked you that. How did you do it? And he said, he said he wanted to be the one person in the world who could do what he did. Yeah, he right. just he didn't want anybody else to be able to do what he can do. He says at the end of the day, there's no other Bill Cosby, and I think that's what, for me, you know, I, I have to write within the rules of writing. You can't just go out and just write whatever you want um, and expect it to be accepted because I, it's more important for me to be known as somebody who writes well mm -hmm. uh, st uh, and, and has good storytelling elements than somebody who, who just has a good story and people just love it because it's, you know, it's provocative or it's just something right. that's trendy. I want to be um, remembered as somebody who, man, he can really put pen to paper and, and, and give something that's um, that's inspirational and it means something and it's well spoken. And those are the reviews that I'm getting out of School of Ministry now. So when I went back to read to Protostar, I really had to kind of say, hey, we got to make sure this one stands up to the uh, to the litmus test of, of School yeah. of Ministry realistically because I want people to say, like, you know, He's really a wordsmith, and man, this story is good at the same time. And I wanted to be thought provoking, and I think that's my yeah. As far as his products were concerned, were thought provoking. Well, mm -hmm. he he is a, a the penultimate um, visual storyteller in mm -hmm. a way, and mm -hmm. uh, which is you know brilliance in itself. You're taking the words, but you're also telling stories in your radio show with the fat doctors yeah. and yeah. all of the things that you're doing, and and. If I'm hearing you correctly from before, you were saying that you you got inspired by having to get creative and tell stories with the people that you're working with to heal. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel as if um, God's called me to the position of a healer, either with my hands or with my stories. You know, so I want people to read my book and feel encouraged and inspired. And when I come in to work with, I think they'll tell you, I mean, I'm 100 miles an hour when I work with my patients. I mean, I don't let them you know, mope and get down, and they're always like, why are you always laughing? Why are you always smiling? I said, hey, you know, if I don't give it to you, where are you going to get it from, you know? Yeah. So we have a great time working and trying to keep the energy real high because I think there's there's healing in that, you know? Um, nice. People can get really depressed after they've fallen, broken the hip or anything like that, so it's my job to kind of first make a connection with them, and then it's so much easier to get by and for them to do the things you'd like them to do. Nice. So you motivate people by inspiring them and lifting them up. Right. Yeah, nice, really nice. Um, your future, what do you see upcoming? 
Well, um, definitely looking to uh, continue writing, um, getting Starcross back out on the market next year with Protostar. I also have a novella that I finished um, that's a part of that series that's going to actually tell the story of the, uh, the young bounty hunter who is one of the main uh, protagonists in the book. Uh, it's going to tell his backstory about how he first got started with everything so people can really get a, a, a feel for him. And that's told through first person, and then Protostar will be told through a third person perspective. Um, working on people to uh, school of ministry since it's definitely doing uh, so well. And then next year, I'd like to really get out and be do more uh, speaking, motivational speaking at colleges and things like that. Nice. Uh, just doing the the Jezebel uh, 50 Atlanta, and I'm very grateful for that. So hopefully that you know pushes me out there even more. And if, if movies and and modeling are in the in the uh, future, then that's fine too. Any project that I think is positive. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm definitely willing to take a look at. So you're kind of a walking transmedia machine. <laughs> I would I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like a renaissance man yeah. in, the, in the 2000s. <laughs> yeah, because you've got a blog, you've got a radio show, yeah. you, you've got print, you've got your your hands are in all different kinds of Film media. and, yeah. yeah. I love it. Uh, that's super. That's really very interesting, actually, because you're exploring all the different methodologies for telling a story. So yeah. it's fascinating that you know, and that's really um, what we want to do is help people like you tell your story. So it's that's yeah. how we tie in. Um, yeah. At the end of every show, we ask our guests to offer. A challenge of the week, and that could be anything, the first thing that comes to your mind. If you could challenge people out there, either young adults, millennials, baby boomers, whoever, um, to do one thing that you think might encourage them or inspire them or motivate them to, to you know, just live, live life, what would that be? I would say... Everybody needs to buckle down and try something next week that they have never tried in their life. If it's, okay. pick, up, if it's pick up a book, if it's write a book, if it's to exercise, if it's to try something as far as a new food, new music, new something, just see what is out there that, that is to be offered by the world that they've never experienced before. and just They might end up liking it. That sounds awesome. I love it. I'm, I'm getting one more question on the snare project and dealing with Hollywood. Is it difficult? No, um, it's not because, you know, I just believe that, you know, people are people um, and everybody has challenges. I don't really get starstruck, you know. Um, I think that everybody, I look at pe I look at even celebrities today and I go, man, I know they, they've got an issue somewhere because we all do. We're all <laughs> human. We all have something that we that's have true. to get over about ourselves. Yeah. So. Um, in Hollywood, you know, I don't think that's much different. I think there's definitely a lot more that you can get wrapped up in if you're not grounded, and that's on any level. Yeah. Um, but it hasn't been a challenge for me because I, I've learned to accept people uh, the way they are, and I've learned to uh, just try to find my place and help them. That's awesome. Uh, have you heard of Stage 32? No. Oh, well, I was thinking about you when you were talking about your, your writing because yesterday there was a, it's a, it's a social networking platform for people, for creatives, people who are in the film and um, theater industry. Okay. And we had the founder on our, our show uh, back in, what, May? And April or May, yeah, he yeah. was phenomenal. And yesterday there was a feed going on in the discussion board about where people like to write, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny how everybody is different and and how they like to write. Uh, whether they write in a coffee shop where they can write with people around, where they can't write mm -hmm. with people around. So it was an interesting conversation. But I'll, it is, it, you might want to take a look at it, so, right, okay. Cynthia? <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 phenomenal. We had um, Richard Botto, uh, the founder on with us and he is such a phenomenal and inspiring person but he loves to connect people within the entertainment industry and the stage 32 is a lot about um, not only the connections that are that happen online and the relationships that happen online 
but also the education. So it's mm -hmm. people with experience sharing with people who don't have as much experience and people sh cross pollinating on visions and talent and it's it's a terrific stage 32 we'll send that to you stage 32.com oh, yeah, yeah yeah anyway um, this has been a terrific discussion today we want to thank you for joining us on yes. our show today dr. Braxton and thank you for having me I appreciate it yeah please keep us posted on all your upcoming projects so that we can help let people know about these things as they evolve um, We'd really like to be part of, like I said, that storytelling, helping you tell your story. So. And where, where can we find the School of Ministry, and where can we find the Fat Doctors? Okay. Um, 1380 WAOK is the radio station down here in Atlanta. It also does live stream, uh, so if they Google it, they'll be able to find it in some of the old clips, or if they just want to listen to it on Saturday at 8 o'clock a.m. Eastern. Uh, the School of Ministry has its own website, theschoolofministry.com. Um, oh. That's where they'll find links. They'll get some of the review snippets, excerpts of the book there as well, some backstory. They can read about the characters and everything. Um, and then also there's links to where the book will be purchased. Uh, Barnes & Noble uh, has it and also on Amazon. Like I say, if they, if they want to get a deal on the, um, on the Kindle version right now, it's a very special sale going on. They can pick it up at a really reduced price. Nice. I'm going to do that this today. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Super. Well, thank you. Like I said, and, and if you all are interested, we at Virtual Newsmakers like to share creative stories of people who are using today's media to, you know, do very creative things, make a difference. Um, if you like what we're doing here, we'd love it if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, virtualnewsmakers.com. And next week, we'll be seeing you with another show. Thank you. See y'all later. Bye.